sometimes moving into a new house is inevitable, and sadly sometimes that is a decision that is forced upon us. But the people you are about to meet in this video are people who were forced to move to a new house, but did everything in their power to fight back. These are 15 owners who refused to move out at any price. Number 15. Edith Macefield You probably have never heard of Edith Macefield, but you've heard of the movie she inspired. Yes, this is the woman who inspired part of the Pixar movie Up. I mean, sure, she never flew away to Paradise Falls, but I'm sure she would have liked to. In 2006, Edith received an offer of $1 million to sell her 108-year-old farmhouse and she said no. The proposed deal was that she would leave the house to make way for a five-story commercial development. No matter how many times the company came back, Edith just repeated the word no. Realizing that she would likely never sell, the company decided to do the next best thing, which would be giving up and moving on to something else, but they didn't want to do that either, so they just built the structure around her house. There's a pattern here, right? During the battle, Edith became a local hero, the lone woman who stood up to big business. In 2008, Edith died at the age of 86 in the same house she lived in all her life. You know, the one surrounded by the five-story structure. Like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 14. Vera Koking When it comes to casinos, it's long been said that the house always wins. Apparently, casino owners also think that applies to their lives. But surprise, surprise, that's absolutely not true. Look no further than the number of casino owners who get into financial problems. In 1961, Vera Koking and her husband bought a home in New Jersey for $20,000. In the 1970s, Penthouse Magazine publisher Bob Guccione offered her a million dollars for her house, hoping to build the Penthouse Boardwalk Hotel and Casino on site, but she declined the offer. So Guccione did what all scumbag casino owners do, he started building the hotel and casino around her house. But when financing dried up, he was forced to stop construction. In 1993, the hotel structure was torn down, and just months later, Donald Trump came to town. Trump had been buying lots around his Atlantic City casino and hotel to make way for a limousine parking lot. But Koking, who had lived in the house for 32 years, refused to sell. Which is when the government stepped in and, in true capitalist form, sided with the businessman. The city condemned her house, offering her $251,000, and kicked her out. Guess the house did win in this case. Number 13. The Bridge House it seems that the word no doesn't exist for people who want to build things. In China, however, people aren't just businessmen and entrepreneurs, they're the government. And if the Chinese government wants to build a bridge, they're gonna build a bridge. That's what happened here. In Guangzhou, the Chinese government began buying up houses in the area to build a bridge. But it wasn't quite so simple. One woman refused to sell, and she refused to sell, and she refused to sell again. No matter how many times the government came back and how good their offer may have been, the woman wasn't interested in selling. So the government decided to just go ahead with the building plan anyway. Yes, the government literally sandwiched the house in the middle of a bridge. And weirdly enough, she kinda liked it. According to her, she finds the situation quiet, liberating, and peaceful. And she does doesn't seem to give much thought to what other people may think about the whole situation. I guess this is one example of someone who stood up to the government and won. Number 12. Orlando Capote Meet Orlando Capote, a man with the dubious honor of having his tiny home surrounded by the biggest housing development in Coral Gables history. Yes, his once beautiful home has been turned into nothing more than a novelty because he refused to sell his house to people looking to make a quick buck. 
In fact, Orlando has refused to sell the house from the very first day that the idea was floated. And today, even as the development towers high over his little house, he remains steadfast in his determination to not move out. The house is my soul, so what good is it to, you know, sell your soul for, for all the money in the world? Which is an impressive stance to take, considering all of the things that probably suck about the situation. I mean, think about it, daylight is likely pretty limited, cell service probably sucks, good luck watching TV. But don't worry, because I'm sure you can just ask one of your many, many neighbors. Despite his determination, Orlando Capote could not bring an end to the creation of the Plaza Coral Gables development, but he seems to be just fine about the state of his life at the moment. Again, even though he probably gets little to no daylight on an average day. Number 11. Curtis Pendergrass would you want a road to run through your property? I would take an educated guess and say that most people would take a straightforward no on that. Curtis Pendergrass is one of those no's. In 2018, Pendergrass, an Ohio homeowner, was asked to sell 0.013 acres of his land to allow officials to align roads near his house. This street in question is apparently something of a death trap in itself, and this new road would potentially limit the number of accidents, however, the offer was pretty terrible. The officials offered Pendergrass 1,900 for the trouble, and the road would go pretty much right through the middle of his front yard. And that's before you factor in the neighborhood reaction, which is very much in Pendergrass's corner. Nobody wants more traffic in this small community. Actually, this is a rare case in which Pendergrass isn't opposed to selling his home to the officials, but he wants to sell the entire property property or nothing. Which makes sense, what's the point of selling a tiny part of your property, and one that would go through the middle of your house at that? Number 10. The Highway House Imagine just for a second that you want to go for a walk, but when you step out of the house, you find yourself in the middle of the highway. That's pretty much the story of Luo Baogan's life. Many years ago, the Chinese government decided that they would build a brand new highway. The only problem, one they have apparently faced many times, was that there was a whole community of people in the way. So the Chinese government offered every homeowner around $41,000 to evacuate and allow the house to be demolished. But Luo Baogan and his wife said no. To them, that payment was nowhere near enough to pay for a new home, so they stood their ground and refused to go anywhere, no matter how much the Chinese government urged them. Unfortunately for them, the Chinese government had no intentions of just moving on, and just paved a new road around the house. So now the Baogun's home is basically the centerpiece of a makeshift roundabout presumably a strategy to force them out. Well, the joke is on the government. The Baojins still live there and have no interest in leaving. Number 9. The Ring Viaduct if, like me, you expect this video to be a bunch of American millionaires taking advantage of the little guy, boy, we were wrong. Here we have yet another example of the Chinese government being told no, and then doing it anyway. When Chinese authorities in Guangzhou approached apartment residents to evacuate their homes so they could build a road, they were clearly told no. But as we've come to learn, the Chinese government doesn't really like that word, so they seem to just ignore it most of the time. This is no exception. Unable to force the residents to abandon their apartments, the government adapted to the obstacle and built a ring road surrounding the whole building. But don't think that the residents have just come to accept this blatant irritation. They requested a lot of compensation from the Chinese government. Good luck getting that. The compensation claims are still ongoing and are apparently spiraling out of control for local authorities. I'm sure we'll We'll all shed a tear tonight, thinking of the poor Chinese government. All they wanted to do was kick people out of their homes. Number 8. Sala Ujani 
France is known for many, many things. Their bakeries, their cathedrals, their adult bookstores. Hey, it's Europe, you know they're all over the place. But if there's one thing that defies France more than any other, surely it has to be the cafe. In the old neighborhood of Rubai, in northern France, there's only one building, and it's a coffee shop. Everything else is rubble, leaving this lone building in the middle of nowhere. Salah Ujani moved to France from Algeria in 1949 and bought the building in 1965 when the neighborhood was still bustling. Along with his wife Jeanette, Salah turned the building into a cafe, dedicating himself to his life's work. But since 2002, every building in the neighborhood was bought and demolished. Salah was the only one to refuse, wanting to hold on to his life's work and his fond memories of the building. Because Salah refused to sell, the original plan for the site, a new eco-district that would provide homes for 240,000 people has yet to be built. His cafe gets very few visitors, but he doesn't care. Clearly, it's not about the money for Salah. Number 7. Holland Island In its final years, Holland Island only had one house, and it truly did look like the kind of house you'd see in a horror movie. But the story behind his lone home isn't terrific, at least not in the traditional sense. Holland Island was first settled in the 1600s, and by the 1900s, the island had around 360 residents. At its peak, the island was a bustling hub of activity with 70 homes, many stores, and more stuff. But by 1920, the island was suffering the eroding after effects of the wind and tide. Unable to fix their crumbling homes, most of the residents evacuated and headed for the mainland. By 1922, everybody was gone. Over time, the houses started to disappear beneath the water, except for one. Yes, this is a story where the house literally said no to death. In 1995, a Methodist minister named Stephen White, who had grown up on the island, bought the house and tried his best to preserve its legacy. He spent almost $150,000 to save the island, but by 2010, the house finally collapsed. The next year, the water had arisen to completely conceal Holland Island. You can't say no to nature. Number 6. The Nail House We've already discovered that the Chinese government will do just about anything to ensure their projects go ahead. It turns out that so many people refuse to evacuate that there's now a name for houses that block traffic. The Nail House. Apparently, the houses earn this name because they refuse to be hammered down. And it's becoming more well-known all over China. This house in Shanghai is one of the most famous nail houses. When the Chinese government came to the homeowners in 2003, the family refused to move, claiming that the compensation offered was not good enough. The officials came back with more and more offers, but every single one was rejected, so the government built the road around the house, creating an elaborate nightmare for both the owners and the commuters. Then in 2017, the owners finally relented. The government returned once again to make an offer, granting the owners 2.7 million won, that's around $412,000. With the green light, the Chinese government moved fast, demolishing the house overnight within a space of just 90 minutes. Well, at least they paid. Number 5. Takao Shito if there is anything worse than having to live on or next to a bustling highway, it has to be this. Takao Shito is a Japanese farmer who has long refused to sell his house to make way for an airport. In the 1960s, Japanese officials asked Takao Shito's father to evacuate his home to make way for the Narito International Airport. The village was composed of 28 households, but Shito was the only one who refused to go anywhere. And if you're thinking it was because the Japanese officials offered some measly sum, you'd be wrong. They offered the homeowner around $1.8 million, but Shito didn't want the money. He exercised his legal right to force the airport to build around his land. Decades later, Takao Shito is still upholding his father's demands. 
He has no interest in the money, he just wants to continue his farming in peace. Shito's farm grows up to 10 types of vegetables at any one time, regardless of the excessive noise and air pollution which is kind of impressive in its own right, and despite the continued hopes of the Japanese officials, it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Number 4. The Half House When you see a fairly tiny home attached to a much bigger one, it's usually something known as a spite house. This weird half home is not a spite house, actually it's something more like the kind of nail house you'd see in China. But we're actually in Toronto, Canada, where this house is 100% legal. And in fact, it has quite the history. The main house was built sometime between 1890 and 1893, and it was one of six identical homes on the same street. But in the middle of the 20th century, a questionable land holdings company started buying up all the houses. Because these are row houses, the officials had to tear down the houses one half at a time. But 54 and a half refused forcing the authorities to very, very carefully tear down the neighbor in such a way that the facade would not be disturbed. The house has proudly stood in Toronto ever since, though it's apparently starting to show signs of age. Still, for half a house, it's lasted remarkably long. It's as much of a part of Toronto's history as any other historical building. Number 3. Austin Spriggs he sounds like the protagonist of a children's book, I know. But Austin Spriggs is something of a local legend in the Washington, D.C. area. His home, a tiny townhouse, sits on the edge of a gaping chasm, all because he refused to go. In 1980, Austin Spriggs and his wife, Gladys, bought the house for $135,000. For the next few decades, the surrounding area was a little rusty for lack of a better word. It became known for abandoned lots claimed by the homeless and prostitutes. Then in 2003, the arrival of the Washington Convention Center changed everything, transforming the area into a beautiful place to live. Officials offered Spriggs between two and three million dollars to move out, even though the house was assessed at around 200,000 at best. He refused. Waves of developers came and went, hoping to convince him to sell, but Spriggs refused and continues to do so. His home is his life, and he has no intentions of selling it to anybody, which is why this tiny house, sitting above a giant canyon, ready to fall at any time, is a powerful metaphor. The little guy clinging to his land. Good for you, Spriggs. Number 2. Michael Forbes as pretty much all of us know, everybody has an opinion on Donald Trump. It's kind of impossible to be indifferent at this point. Michael Forbes, however, he had an opinion on Trump several years before the rest of the world did. Forbes, a farmer in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, received notice that Trump was looking to build a luxury golf course in his area. And he wanted the land. But Forbes said no, kickstarting years of conflict. Trump lashed out, saying his farm was in a state of disrepair, so Forbes painted the words, no golf course, on his shed. The greatest thing I've ever done for the environment. Trump hired contractors to fence off land owned by Forbes. Trump hired people to forcibly remove Forbes and others from their homes, and claimed that the property was a slum. You, uh, kinda get the picture here. Forbes gave a simple reply to the media, Trump can take his money and shove it up his arse. Forbes' story became such a sensation that it became a documentary. You've been trumped. A year later, he was named the top Scot at the Glenfiddich Spirit of Scotland Awards for taking on Trump, an award that angered Trump so much, he said Glenfiddich was a terrible embarrassment to Scotland. Takes one to know one, I guess. Number 1. The Impractical Nail House We've seen a lot of nail houses today. This is quite literally the most impractical of all of them. How in the world is anybody supposed to deal with this? Better ask the Chinese government. Like the other nail houses, this is the result of a homeowner refusing to give in to the Chinese government. No matter the compensation or offers they received, the homeowner stood their ground and said no. But this is also one of the most confusing end results because, again, this doesn't seem to benefit anybody. The homeowners suffer, the commuters can't really get around the house. It would probably have been more convenient to just build a ramp and ask drivers to 
jump the house. But if you're not Evil Knievel, and I will take an educated guess to say that most people watching this are not, that's probably not too practical either. Either way, this is a sucky situation for everybody. Whether you think the homeowners were right or wrong to give in, this is a perfect example of the dangers of refusing to yield. If you were offered a significant sum of money to move out, would you do it? Let us know in the comments. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.